which means that the violation of either and not the two aspects together would void an election. The interpretation of Section 83 of the Elections Act is not a new matter in this court. In Raila 2013, this court engaged the import of this section in determining the principles of the burden of proof. Four, in, in, four principles emerged. One, where a party alleges nonconformity with the electoral law, the petitioner must not only prove that there has been noncompliance with the law, but that such failure of noncompliance did affect the validity of the elections. Two, it is on that basis that the respondent bears the burden of proving the contrary. This emerges from a long-standing common law approach in respect of alleged irregularity in acts of public <coughs> bodies. All acts are presumed to have been rightly and regularly done unless proved otherwise. This finding is similar to the one by Justice Kimondo in Steve Karaoke and in Mike Panjohi, where he held Section 83 of the Elections Act is couched in a, the negative language, introducing a rebuttable presumption in favor of the respondents. That election was conducted properly and in accordance with the law. Thirdly, the third principle, so the petitioner must set out by raising firm, credible evidence of the public authority's departure from the prescriptions of the law. And the Oh, so there are three, not four. I need to make a, I'll, I'll correct that. Consequently, following a successful appeal by Honorable Peter Munya in Munya II, to consider the vitiation of his election by the appellate court in the matter that I have just quoted, we considered the application of Section 83 of the Elections Act in determining election causes. And by unanimous decision of the court, we cited with approval Lord Denning's dictum in Morgan versus Simpson and held as follows. In this case, as in other election matters coming up before the courts, the question as to the nature or extent of electoral irregularities and as to their legal effect repeatedly arises. The crisp <coughs> issue is how do irregularities and related malfunctions affect the integrity of an election? In Morgan versus Simpson, Lord Denning evaluated cases that had been cited by counsel and impacted upon by duty of courts in making declarations upon hearing election petitions. He summarized the law in three propositions. One, if the election was conducted so badly that it was not substantially in accordance with the law as to the elections, the election is, vici is vitiated irrespective of whether the result was affected or not. Secondly, if the election was so conducted that it was substantially in accordance with the law, so as, as to elections, it is not vitiated by a breach of the rules or a mistake at the polls, provided it did not affect the results of the election. But even though the election was conducted substantially in accordance with the law as to elections, nevertheless, if there was a breach of the rules or a mistake at the polls and it did affect the results, then the election is vitiated. Although the majority in this case claims maiden privilege of interpreting provisions of Section 83 of the Elections Act, this court in the Munya case had already settled the issue in 2014. And the ultimate decision of this court in the Peter Munya case, Munya II, is summarized in the four paragraphs as follows, from paragraph 213. The court observed that the practical realities of electoral administration are such that the imperfections in the electoral process are inevitable. And on this account, elections should not be lightly overturned, especially when neither a candidate nor the voters have engaged any wrongdoing. It is clear to us that an election should be conducted substantially in accordance with the principle of the Constitution as set out in Article 81. Voting is to be conducted in accordance to the principles set out in Article 86. The Elections Act and the regulations thereunder constitute the substantive procedural law for the conduct of elections. If it should be shown that an election was conducted substantially in accordance with the principles of the Constitution and the Election Act, then such election is not to be invalidated only on the ground of irregularities. Where, however, 
It is shown that the irregularities were of such magnitude that they affected the election result. Then such an election stands to be invalidated. Otherwise, procedural and administrative ir irregularities and other errors occasioned by human imperfection are not enough by and of themselves to vitiate an election. This interpretation by this court was upheld in subsequent consistent decisions of the Supreme Court. In Nathif Jama Adam versus Abdikan Osman Mohammed, in my concurring opinion, in Evans Odiambo Kidero versus Ferdinand Waitito, and a number of other cases. The Supreme Court has consistently applied the test of Section 83 with the result of the election in mind. The qualitative component, that is the result of the election, is an integral element of the election cause. In a presidential election petition, the petitioner challenges the election of the presidential elect. The result of the election of the president by constitutional requirement is only ascertained when the formula under Article 138.4 of the Constitution has been met. Anyone challenging the election must therefore challenge both the quantitative aspect in the Constitution and the qualitative aspect of the election. Unlike the situation in Morgan versus Simpson, which was a municipal election, or a gubernatorial election, as was the case in Peter Munya, the constitutional threshold in a presidential election is anchored on numbers, the formula. The drafters of the constitution were very clear that Kenyans ought to elect as a president, a person who was acceptable to more than half of the voters of Kenya, and one supported by at least 25% of the votes cast in each of more than half the counties. It is only such a person who has garnered that percentage threshold in terms of popular support that is to be declared as president. This was one of the irreducible minimums for a transformative change in Kenya's electoral architecture. There was a purpose to this formula, the need for national cohesion, a unifying personality, a nationally popular individual in a petition relating to a presidential election. The election court must therefore ascertain that any question as to the quality of the election has affected the constitutional quantitative threshold. According to Barry Weinberger, in his book, The Resolution of Election Disputes, Legal Principles That Control Election Challenges. The legal position is that election results will be upheld unless it has been proved by the court that irregularities and illegalities changed the result of an election or made it impossible to determine the will of the electorate. He observes, quote, where the courts can determine which ballots were illegal but had been counted, those ballots are subtracted to the, from the candidates' totals. Where the courts can determine which ballots were legal but had not been counted, those ba ballots were added to the candidates' totals. After the illegal votes have been subtracted from the candidates' totals and the legal votes have been added, the candidate with the most votes will be the victor. The upshot of my analysis here is that the alleged illegalities or, or irregularities ought to have a nexus with the declared result, particularly in a presidential election in this country. Having talked my mind about what I think Section 83 means and does, I'd like to address an issue. I have titled it, Preserving Kenya's Electoral Jurisprudence construing the principle of precedent in election matters. Having set out my reasons for dissenting with the decision of the majority, and having espoused an interpretation of Section 83 of the Elections Act, in line with the standards laid out in RILA 2013, with the conclusion that any deviation from written law must be evaluated in terms of the Constitution due to the sui generis and right-centric nature of election causes, I note with great concern 
the disregard by the majority of clear set and settled principles of electoral dispute resolution in the following terms. A, the majority in this case has reversed the interpretation of section 83 laid out in the Peter Munya 2B case and affirmed by this court in numerous cases by setting a standard for the conduct of elections that is impossible to meet and completely exposes the rights of the voters to judicial trump. The will of the little man walking to the little booth, making his ballot, marking his ballot with a little mark in secret and in, in free and fair elections has now been burdened with a standard that does not take into account the existing environment with which elections are conducted globally. The practice has been to check any errors which are to be expected against the effect on the declared result of the elections. The Constitution itself makes it imperative for the quantitative and qualitative elements of declaration to be pleaded and proved to the required burden and standard before an election can be set aside. Article 138.4 of the elections provides the numerical consideration that must be satisfied before one can be declared an elected president. This numerical standard ought to be checked against the terms of Article 38. Did every person have the freedom to vote? Under 81C, were the elections free and fair? Under, 80, under Article 83, did every person have the opportunity to be registered as a voter? Under Article 86, was the voting method used simple, accurate, verifiable, accountable, transparent? Did the counting, tabulation, and collation of votes announced promptly by the presiding and run, returning officers? Were there mechanisms to eliminate, to eliminate electoral malpractice that were put in place? And were the election materials safely stored? Under Article 88, were the elections conducted by an, an independent electoral body? And under Article 82, was the conduct of the election in line with legislation on elections as read with the Constitution. I now turn to examine the effect of reversing the electoral jurisprudence already settled by this court and applied across the country at all levels of Kenya's judicial system. I shall address the following questions in my analysis. One, when can or should this court depart or reverse itself from any of its previous decisions? Two, what is the effect of the wholesale reversal of electoral jurisprudence by the Supreme Court? Three, what avenues exist now for the lower courts? <laughs> this court can and may depart from its previous decisions. Article 163.7 of the Constitution of Kenya stipulates as follows. Quote, all courts other than the Supreme Court are bound by the decisions of the Supreme Court. Quote, in the case of Jasbir Singh Rai versus Talochan Singh Rai, this court had the occasion to consider instances when it can depart from its previous decisions. Several principles to guide that matter emerged. This is what we said. The court can depart from its previous decisions, one, in special circumstances. We said, as a matter of consistent practice, the decisions of the higher courts are to be maintained as precedent. The foundation laid by such courts is in principle to be sustained. This, of course, leaves an opening for the special circumstances which may, be occasioned, which may occasionally dictate a departure from previous decisions. The second principle, or the second reason in which we can depart is for good cause after taking into account legal considerations of significant weight. Where we said in principle, therefore it follows that this court, an apex court, can indeed depart from its previous decisions for good cause and after taking into account legal considerations of significant weight. We also said we can depart where the impugned decision was obiter, dictum, and we said we can also depart where the impugned decision was given for incurium. Those are the four 
grounds on which under just bill we said we can depart. In that case, we said, for the special role of precedent in the certainty and predictability of the law as it plays out in daily transactions, any departure is to be guided by rules well recognized. It is the, a general rule that the court is not bound to follow its previous decisions where such decision was in obiter, in, in procurium, etc. I'm sorry, I'm just, repeating. I'm, I'm just repeating what I had said earlier. The consideration in this case in light of the petitioner's claim was, the consideration in this case in light of the petitioner's <coughs> claim is, was the judgment of this court in the Peter Munya case obiter dictum or was it delivered in procurium? That was in just bill. So, well, there are a number of paragraphs which I don't need to go to. But those questions, those are the questions we need, or the major majority needed to have asked itself. I do not see that they applied this test when they chose to depart. Um, however, I have added a, a, a number of other grounds, which I think, in other jurisdictions, may be used by an apex court to depart. For example, the court may find that the circumstances are different. But in this case, what is different? What circumstances are different? RILA 2013, RILA 2017. Which circumstances would be so different that will persuade the majority to depart. I don't see any. Um, let me just then say this. <clears throat> Section 3 of the Supreme Court Act and the body of jurisprudence from this court is central to the preservation, protection, and affirmation of the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution were fully aware that this is the only court that can reverse itself as it's not bound by its own decisions. However, considerations for reversal or departure must be carefully weighed against various considerations. Departure from electoral jurisprudence, in my view, departure from electoral jurisprudence is, in my view, inviting an even firmer and higher restraint from departure of well-settled principles. The judiciary is one of the is one of several critical institutions that act as anchors of the Constitution. The others are the people, the executive, the legislature, independent commissions, state officers, and offices. All these institutions interact with the law, each with each other, in a manner that is clear, certain, stable, and predictable. A different approach will threaten the fabric of institutional legal interaction. The law is a primary limb of the body politic. I am persuaded by the opinion of Justice Aaron Barak, former Chief Justice and President of the Israeli Supreme Court, in his book, The Judiciary in a Democracy, where he says, talking on the scope of precedent and the need to balance the interests of justice by following precedent or by deviating from it, he says, quote, a judge stands before a dilemma to follow precedent previously determined by his court or to deviate from it. The judge must use his discretion reasonably. What should a judge do? The, reasonable te the reasonableness test requires the judge to consider, on the one hand, all considerations supporting and honoring and following of the precedent. On the other hand, the judge must consider the full scope of considerations pointing towards deviation from precedent and choosing new law. The judge must assign each one of these systems of considerations its proper weight. Having done that, the judge must place both on the scale. The judge must choose the prevailing ruling. The judge must choose the ruling whose utility is greater than the damage caused by it. The guiding principle should be this. 
Is it appropriate to de deviate from a previous president if a new president's contribution to bridging the gap between law and society and to the protection of the Constitution and its values after setting off the damage caused by the change is greater than the contribution of the previous president to the realization of those goals? Deviation from precedent particularly president of the highest court, is a serious matter. Great sensitivity is needed to weigh all considerations. End quote. The doctrine of stare decisis is a critical element in our legal system, providing certainty and predictability in the law as consistently guided by this court. Aptly put, in the case of Peter Giturai, Munya, and IBC and two others, and in the concurring opinion of Mutunga CJ, as he was then, he said, under Article 163.7, all courts other than the Supreme Court are bound by the decisions of the Supreme Court. Thus, the adopted theory of interpretation of the Constitution will bind all courts other than the Supreme Court. It will also undergird various streams and strands of our jurisprudence that represent the holistic interpretation of the Constitution. Although this court is not bound by its decisions and can review or depart from them, such considerations ought to be done only in the clearest of cases and distinguishable in fact, circumstances and relevance as elaborated in the foregoing paragraphs. The majority in this case failed this critical test. I must add that the value of their deviation from precedent damages more than it offers utility. It will cause damage to the legal system before it turns the because it turns the electoral, let me repeat that, it will cause damage to the legal system because it turns the entire electoral jurisprudence on its head. Every arm of government has a unique role of defending the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the sovereignty of the people. The essence of the system of checks and balances is to ensure that when one constitutional branch threatens the entire schematic ordering of the Constitution and state, the other is ready to check the actions. Having been part of the inaugurable Supreme Court and having steadily and consistently settled the law of elections, the interpretation of Section 83 by the majority in this case will unleash jurisprudential confusion never before witnessed. Unfortunately, we are part of the common system, encumbered by rules requiring lower courts to pay due deference to the courts above. Parliament must therefore untie the hands of the courts below by clarifying the meaning of Section 83 of the Elections Act. That is the only way we can avert a crisis of jurisprudence in such a sensitive area of law such as this. However, in the meantime, lower courts are not without an option. The decision by the majority is one given in a presidential election and which does not usurp the jurisdiction of the uh, lower courts in other electoral disputes. At paragraph 207 in Rylard 2013, we held, quote, the Supreme Court cannot roll over the defined range of the electoral process like a colossus. The court must take care not to usurp the jurisdiction of lower courts in electoral disputes. It follows that the annulment of a presidential election will not necessarily vitiate the entire general election. And the annulment of an election, presidential election did not occasion a constitutional crisis as the authority to declare a presidential election invalid is granted by the Constitution itself. Let me conclude. <clears throat> election causes ought to be determined in the light of the highest consideration of the right of the electorate to vote in a free and fair election. This court must never abdicate its duty as an election court exercising exclusive original jurisdiction to hear and determine disputes to re relating to elections arising under Article 140. As an election court, the court must not narrow its scope of its remedies or delegate its powers to the parties. The zeal of the voter to participate in elections and the overwhelming responsibility of every stakeholder to conduct free and fair elections must be matched by equal zeal from this court. The majority nullified the conduct of the presidential election solely on the basis that some forms 34A and 34B lacked security features which are elected by the commission and spread in different versions across most forms. 
The majority in the aftermath of the registrar's report did not attempt to peruse the enormous evidence deposited by the first and second respondents bearing certified copies of Form 34A, Form 34B, of the constitu to, and, and check and against which they ought to have checked the alleged irregularities. By subjecting the integrity of the election to considerations of design that are neither statutory or regulatory, the majority has not only threatened the people's belief in the electoral system, it has overburdened and in fact negated the electorate's right to franchise. Mr. Slobdan Milakik, a professor emeritus at Montesquieu University, in, justice, in his book, Justice Coming Face to Face with Electoral Norms, states that the will of the electorate is ultimately the core of any electoral process and should jealously be guarded by the courts in order to maintain public confidence in the electoral process. He says the importance in a democracy of a transparent and fair election of both individual and collective rights to be respected immediately takes real shape if one but thinks an electoral crisis. The guiding principle in the exercise of constitutional jurisdiction is that the function of the court ultimately is to ensure the prevalence of the will of the electorate. If this is not so, public confidence in the electoral pro process will be heavily compromised. It is important that the public perception remains throughout that it is the decision of the electorate that has prevailed. In election causes, in this election cause, the majority ought to have disengaged the mechanical gear of appellate jurisdiction and fully considered the evidence against the dictates of burden and standard of proof. The absence of time is not a sufficient excuse. The court has a competent institution, the court has a competent institution of research and is well facilitated to be able to perform the role of an election court as a final verifying agent in cases of mon monumental importance such as the present petition. Finally, I just wish to make a short observation on the following paragraph in the conclusion in the decision of the majority where they said, let me quote, let this judgment then be read in its proper context. The electoral system in Kenya today was designed to be simple and verifiable. Between 8th August 2017, 11th August 2017, it cannot be said to have been so. The petition before us was however simple and to the point. It is obvious to us that the IEBC misunderstood it, hence its jumbled up reasons and submissions. Our judgment is also simple and our, clear, our view clear and understandable. It ought to lead the IEBC on a soul searching and go back to the drawing board. The next sentence is where I'm raising my concern. If not, this court, whenever called upon to adjudicate on a similar dispute, will reach the same decision if the anomalies remain the same, irrespective of who the aspirants may be. Consistency and fidelity to the Constitution is a non-wavering commitment this court makes. Let me just repeat the words where I am finding I have consternation. If not, this court Whenever called upon to adjudicate on a similar dispute, we'll reach the same decision if the anomalies remain the same. These words to my mind are extremely unfortunate. I find it to be injudicious. It is imprudent. I reiterate in the strongest terms the following observation obtaining from my dissenting judgment in the Speaker of the Senate and another, in which I said, quote, just as Parliament is expected to operate within its constitutional powers, as an arm of government, so must the judiciary. The system of checks and balances that prevents autocracy, restrains institutional excesses, and prevents abuse of power apply equally to the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. No one arm of government is infallible, and all are equally vulnerable to the dangers of acting ultra-virus the Constitution. 
Whereas the executive and the legislature are regularly tempered and safeguarded through the process of regular direct elections by the people, the discipline of an unappointed and unelected judicial arm of government is largely self-regulatory. The parameters of encroachment on the powers of other arms of government must therefore be clearly delineated, limits acknowledged, and restraint fully exercised. It is only through practice of such cautionary measures that the remotest possibility of judicial tyranny can be avoided. Having evaluated the entire bundles of evidence submitted by the parties and having checked the allegations made by the petitioner against the evidence, it is clear to me, had the majority been engaged in the mode of a court of exclusive original jurisdiction, looking at all the evidence, it would have found each and every allegation in the petition was addressed to a satisfactory standard, and where and if the burden of proof shifted, the commission, that's the first respondent, discharged satisfactorily. In view of the foregoing, had I been in command of the, the majority, and unfortunately I am not, this would have been my determination. Having analyzed the various sections laid out in the rubric, having disagreed with the decision of the majority, and having consistently interpreted the Constitution to reflect the call of the Constitution's preambular paragraph that the people of Kenya, exercising their sovereign and inalienable right to determine the form of governance in our country, I hereby set down the following orders that flow from the ratio. One, as to whether the 20,000, sorry, one, as to whether the 2017 presidential election was conducted in accordance with the principles laid down in the Constitution and the law relating to elections, I find it was so properly conducted, and in particular with reference to Articles 1 and 38 of the Constitution of Kenya, and supported by Articles 2, 10, 81, 82, 83, 86, and 138. As to whether there were illegalities committed in the conduct of the said election, I am satisfied that there was no instance of fraud or illegality found or proven. Three, as to whether there were irregularities committed in the conduct of the said ele election, I am satisfied that any irregularities that were found did not favor any particular candidate and could not have impacted in any way on the result of the election. Four, as to whether the election was properly conducted by the first respondent in accordance with the Constitution and the laws related to the elections, I am satisfied that with all the attendant challenges of conducting a national election, that this was so properly conducted. Five, as to whether the second respondent properly declared the third respondent as president-elect in accordance with Article 138.4 and 138.10 of the Constitution, I am satisfied that indeed he did so. Six, as to whether the third respondent was validly and properly elected to the office of the President of the Republic of Kenya, I am satisfied from all the evidence assessed that he indeed was. Petition number one of 2017 is hereby dismissed, and each party shall bear their own costs.